again. Today we're going to talk about lecture three in which uh, we learn about the empires that were developing in the Americas at this time. Now again, we're going to focus on North America. There's a lot of stuff going on down in South America, um, but we're not going to get into it right now. Um, and so today's lecture will, it will be comparison of empires, Spain, France, and England. We want to compare how these uh, these European cultures uh, moved into North America and how they influenced uh, and interacted with native peoples. Okay, so again we start with the essential question. Now I know somebody uh, in class the other day uh, asked why is it that our essential questions are never actually que questions but rather statements. Um, that's just a bureaucratic thing. Uh, we, we call it an essential question, but I really don't like to do it as an essential question. I want you to do something. I don't necessarily want you to answer something. So I write it as a statement, but it satisfies the same requirement. Anyway, in this case, um, the essential question or the essential statement is uh, you, we, we want to compare and contrast the different goals and strategies used by the English, French, and Spanish in their interactions with and or conquest of North Americans. Alrighty? So if we're going to take a look at this, then what we want to do, anytime that you're asked to analyze something, now this is really, really important with regard to your AP um, essays that you're going to do. You're going to be asked to analyze things. Now the AP is going to tell you uh, the variables to analyze, but you may very well be asked by a future professor uh, you know, to analyze a particular issue, then when you do that, you're going to have to make uh, decisions as to what exactly it is that you're going to analyze. We could be analyzing an awful lot of things with regard to these uh, North American empires, these North American European empires. So I want to break it down a little bit. My goal is to analyze the, uh, the goals of these empires, the goals of Spain, France, and England in uh, colonizing North America. Um, how they interacted with the, um, with the people of North America. And I'm going to focus on two ideas. Uh, the idea of uh, empires of inclusion and exclusion. We'll talk about what that means in just a moment. And also, you know, we're going to discuss some of the consequences of these interactions. So let's take, taking a look at the map here. Oops, let's move this out of the way. I don't like that. All right, so taking a look at the map here, again, focusing on North America, a um, lot of stuff going on down here. And also, you'll notice, if you take a look at the legend here in the, uh, in the bottom left, um, there were some pretty powerful uh, groups that were colonizing in North America and in, in South America at this time. Uh, for our purposes, I, we don't really have the time uh, to go into all of the different cultures and talk about them, but I do want to talk about the British, of course, because they have the most, they're the, culturally the, uh, the group that most influenced American history, the French, and of course the Spanish, who as you can see from the, um, from the map, had the largest claim in, uh, in the Americas. And in fact, for a while, Spain was the largest empire in the world. Um, right. So let's start off looking at Spain. Uh, things got pretty hectic. Of course, uh, Spain uh, and Portugal were the leaders of this, uh, of this exploration in the 15th century and early 16th century. And, um, and it was getting kind of hectic. Uh, the, the Portuguese had, had figured out how to sail their caravels around uh, the Horn of Africa. Uh, you probably learned about that in, in AP World History. Uh, and they were taking a lead in global trade. Uh, Spain, because of Columbus, uh, were making a vast headway in uh, the Americas. And, um, and of course, Portugal wanted a piece of the pie. So, uh, so Spain and Portugal ended up competing in this competition, got pretty heated, uh, at which point the Pope is just going to intervene and say, hey, look, we can't compete um, with each other. We're two Catholic countries were having a hard enough time as it is. Um, we can't be fighting each other. So here's what we're going to do. We're, going to, we're just going to draw a line at the, uh, initially, of course, at the 46-37 uh, 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 line of longitude. And anything 
that is to the, uh, to the east of that will go to Portugal. Anything that is to the west of that will go to Spain, and we'll call it cool. Uh, of course, they didn't realize just exactly how much land there was to the west of, uh, to the west of, uh, of this uh, line of longitude. Um, so it really looks like Spain got the lion's share, and they did, uh, but that was not an intentional thing. Don't forget, by in 1494, all of the, none of the, very little of this land had actually been explored by Europeans. Um, so as it worked out, Brazil is largely going to be focused down here in, in uh, I'm sorry, uh, Portugal is going to be f uh, focusing largely down here in, in Brazil, in fact, exclusively. And as far as Spain was concerned, boom, the rest of it was Spain. So, of course, some other European countries had some problems with that and uh, didn't necessarily follow the Spanish uh, lead here. Um, now, Spain... Spain's goals were fairly simple. We want gold. Uh, we want silver. We want things of value. Uh, they heard rumors of, uh, of El Dorado, these cities of gold. And, um, so, uh, so they wanted to find those and take those. Um, so conquest was the issue. We see this uh, in, uh, in Columbus's writings as well, in which he's looking around at the, at the, uh, the Taino people, the Arawaks, uh, whom he's encountered, and he's saying, hey, wow, these people are really um, innocent and nice and friendly and outgoing and giving. Um, therefore, it would be really easy to conquer them and enslave them and take all of their stuff. Um, and that's exactly what the Spanish pretty much set out to do. Uh, so one goal was pretty much conquest. We're going to conquer, and we're going to take your gold. Of course, they didn't find as much gold as they wanted. Eh, they found some gold in, in, in uh, Peru. Uh, they found silver in Mexico. But ultimately, uh, what they're going to have to deal with is, look, most of the, uh, the wealth to be gained in these areas is going to be the result of farming. Um, so over time, they're going to start the farming process. Another goal is, and this was almost universal uh, among all of these empires, is religious goals. Religion being a driving force of empire during this time. In this case, in the case of Spain, uh, the goal was to convert as many of these heathen natives uh, as they possibly could. These were people who had never been introduced to Jesus, uh, and therefore they, they, they were probably going to go to hell. So, uh, so what we got to do we got to save these, these uh, poor, uh, you know, damned souls, if you will. Um, so it was, um, it was largely Franciscan, Franciscan monks, Franciscan missionaries who uh, traveled with the Spanish, with the Spanish conquistadors, uh, and established missions, well, the Spanish mission system, all throughout the Spanish, uh, the Spanish colonies, and dedicated themselves to converting the, uh, converting the native peoples. Uh, oftentimes against their will, um, oftentimes by, by force um, and coercion, and in, 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 in other forms of coercion. Now, um, this was a very brutal thing. I mean, we're going to conquer and we're going to convert people against their will to a religion yeah, they, they're not really all that interested in necessarily. So, um, and despite this, this is called uh, an empire of inclusion. And what that means is, as this empire moves into uh, other lands, the people who are already living in those lands are going to be incorporated into the empire. They're going to become part of the empire. Um, and in fact, the, the Spanish are going to create kind of a feudal system um, called encomienda, uh, in which the uh, lords in Spain will actually be given rights. Uh, they'll purchase rights to lands in the New World, and any of those people on those lands are, in essence, serfs of the land, and to, to a greater degree, actually property, to a certain extent, of these lords, these Spanish lords moving into, the, into these territories. Um, and despite this, uh, you know, this is inclusion. It's not a nice inclusion, but it's inclusion. Um, and, uh, and, of course, the, the ideal here was that the lords, uh, the... Um, the uh, lords would supervise and protect and convert the, uh, the natives, uh, provide them protection in this world as well as the next. Uh, on the other hand, 
In return, the natives would give them their labor, uh, and they would farm their fields, and they would work their mines. Um, so this was presented or sold as a mutual relationship. Not so much. Uh, the natives really had no desire to farm for uh, foreign uh, landowners, and they certainly didn't want to work in the mines. I mean, of all of the hellish places to live uh, and to work, the Spanish mines were, were among the worst. Uh, and, of course, in a situation in which we have these power discrepancies, um, in which you have a powerful lord and a powerless peasant or laborer or worker or serf, uh, you're going to have exploitation of that power. Um, so what we would refer to as the biological assimilation, people of different cultures coming together to make babies, uh, in this case, the biological assimilation was largely forced, uh, resulting in mixed races, mixed ethnicities, and this was kind of problematic for the Spanish, who saw their, their own culture as being a superior and pure culture. Um, so ultimately what is going to happen in these, uh, in these Spanish colonies is the creation with, of a race-based class system in which your position in, this, in your social class, your social status, was based on uh, the purity of your European bloodline. Um, and the closer you got to the pure white European ideal was, uh, you know, defined how close you were to the top echelons of the society. Um, bam, we have the beginnings of racism, right? Now, not everybody during this time was, uh, was a fan of this particular method. Uh, we cannot argue that people like Columbus and Cortez and Pizarro and these guys who uh, went in and conquered and, and abused uh, the people that they came upon, that they were just men of their times and we can't criticize them. Um, no. Men of their times, including Bartolome de, la, de las Casas, uh, actually said, hey, wait a minute, we shouldn't be treating these people like this. This is absolutely brutal and horrible. And a very popular book of the time uh, was called uh, a, a Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies by Bartolome de, uh, Bartolome, uh, Bartolome de las Casas, um, in which he describes the absolutely brutal, inhuman treatment of the native peoples. Uh, here is an etching from the book, a very famous etching of the book, in which he shows um, native people being mutilated, having their hands cut off by uh, Spanish conquistadors, um, you know, being forced to drink uh, molten metals, uh, being killed, uh, slaughtered, beheaded. Uh, this is just one of the many engravings. There are, there are more, even more brutal uh, such engravings uh, included in this particular book. Um, now, France. France is going to do something a little bit different. Uh, France is also going to have an empire of inclusion in the New World, but theirs is going to be a little bit different. Um, the goals of the French uh, had to do with trade. Uh, they weren't necessarily looking for gold, although they wouldn't have turned it down if they found it, but the gold that they did find was this cute little fella here, all right, the beaver. Um, it turns out that this guy's fur uh, was pretty was considered to be pretty valuable in Europe. Everybody wanted to skin this guy and wear his fur. Uh, they wanted to wear it on their heads. They wanted to wear it on their hands. They wanted to wear it on the feet of their shoulders. They loved wearing this guy's fur, um, much to the chagrin of him, right? Um, because really, if you were a French... Uh, you know, pioneer, uh, French explorer in uh, in the sixty in the sixteenth century, uh, walking around through uh, North America, you almost couldn't help but stumble upon beaver everywhere you went. Uh, they were all over the place. Um, of course, nowadays it's very difficult to actually find a beaver in the wild. Uh, well, that is because his skin and pelt was of considerable value to the French. Sorry, buddy. Um, now, the, um, the French also had some religious uh, goals in mind. 
uh, the, uh, the, the monarchy in France that ruled as, as that absolute monarchy had determined that France was going to, uh, that this new France that developed in and around the, uh, the Mississippi and the St. Lawrence River Valleys, new France was going to be a Roman Catholic uh, empire. It's actually quite a shame for the French because there were plenty of oppressed Huguenots, French Protestants, who would have been perfectly happy to leave France and go to, uh, go to these regions, and, and some man did manage to sneak out. But for the most part, it was Roman Catholics who were allowed to go. Among them, of course, are going to be Roman Catholic missionaries. In this case, it'll be the Jesuits. And they had a somewhat different um, you know, focus than did the, uh, than did, than did the uh, Franciscans, and that the Jesuits tended to uh, live with the native people. Uh, they tended to uh, interact with the native people more, uh, on a more equal basis. And um, they tended to kind of introduce Christianity rather try, than try to enforce Christianity on the native peoples. And therefore, the native peoples tended to get along with them a little bit better. Now, this may have had something to do um, with the number of actual French men who were there. This was largely a male population who went into these areas. Um, and France practiced an empire of inclusion, but this was a voluntary empire of inclusion. Uh, the French went in and they interacted with the native peoples on a much more equal basis. It doesn't necessarily mean that they, they saw the Native Americans as equals, but they certainly interacted on a, in an equal level, um, conducted trade, uh, it wasn't very long before members of, say, the Iroquois nations were able to get their hands on European rifles and technologies and, and, uh, and uh, metal tools and things along those lines, um, and actually became a, a, a power in that region as a result of it. Um, in many cases, too, the, uh, when the French moved in, uh, again, primarily male, uh, you know, colonists here, and of course, if you're primarily male and you're hanging out with native uh, people, the only ones that you have access to are native women. Uh, many French uh, travelers during this time took um, Native American wives uh, and lived according to Native American laws and strictures um, and lived with, with Native Americans as they gathered their beaver pelts um, and sold them in Europe. Uh, I believe the, 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 uh, the, some of these agents were called Cœur de Bois. Cœur de, Cœur de Bois. Uh, these were uh, people who worked for French companies, uh, gathering pelts and, uh, and, selling them and, and shipping them off to France. Others were private contractors. They were going out and they were trying to get as many pelts as they possibly can. In the meantime, settling down with Native American women. Of course, many of these French uh, men actually had wives in Europe, but... Eh, there was no internet, there was no Facebook, we're good. Now the English. Uh, the English, of course, uh, originally came into these colonies to find gold, and of course this, the stories of, say, Jamestown, uh, you're very interesting, of, of men who were coming to, see, to find gold and ultimately starved to death because nobody was willing to do any farming uh, because they were too busy looking for gold, almost destroying the colony. Uh, of course, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh is going to move in, and he is going to introduce a brand new crop uh, called tobacco. This is brilliant. This is, uh, uh, along with beaver, is one of our first global commodities. And if you're going to create a global commodity, it might as well be one that people get addicted to, because then there's always going to be a demand for this, uh, for this uh, you know, commodity. Even when you rediscover 400 years later that using this product will cause a slow, painful, deteriorating death, we still have a multi-billion dollar industry. So this is a pretty good crop. Uh, this is a really good commodity here. Uh, so, uh, so a lot of um, uh, English uh, travelers will come into the Americas and they will uh, set up uh, tobacco farms where they can. Uh, also logging, uh, fishing is going to become, you know, but, mo but mostly farming. Now, England also had some religious issues, some religious goals involved. Unlike the French, who would have been well served had they just sent, allowed their, their Protestants, their Huguenots to come to the Americas, um, but didn't, uh, the English in fact did. They said, hey look, if you uh, have religious beliefs that are, uh, that are contrary to, to what we're doing here in England, feel free to get out. And, uh, and many did. Uh, Puritans and separatists, whom we, whom 
we'll talk about later on, Quakers, even Roman Catholics in, uh, in England made their way to the, uh, to the Americas for the sake of establishing their own, uh, their own societies based on their own beliefs. Also, the English uh, among this, this group were pioneers of investment, the joint stock company, uh, the, uh, this idea of people buying into an enterprise uh, and then sharing the profits from that enterprise and consequently sharing the risks, making it less, uh, less likely to fail. So even though many of the English colonies at first failed miserably, um, you know, even Jamestown almost became, it was almost a failure from the beginning since, uh, since the, uh, the profits were kind of spread out and the losses were spread out, uh, people were willing to continue to invest. Um, so these joint stock companies, many of these joint stock companies are going to become global, global corporations. Um, so, uh, and again, we'll touch on that, some of that later on. Um, these, these colonies were chartered by the king. And um, now the English, when they were interacting with uh, native peoples, they interacted a little bit differently. Uh, the English, unlike the Spanish and the French, practiced um, exclusion. So they created an empire of exclusion where they could. Um, and the idea was, let's drive these native people out of these lands and let's take them. Um, and they did it where they could, and they did it as far as they could, uh, ultimately driving many native tribes uh, over the uh, Appalachian Mountains, uh, where they, they did just did, tried not to interact with each other. Uh, or when they did interact, they were able to interact and then go home and stay away from each other. Um, so there it is. Um, that is a brief comparison of these three empires. Of course, we could go into much greater depth, depth, but um, we simply don't have the time. So I would suggest going into the book, uh, reading, read about the Dutch, read about the Russians, uh, you know, read about the Portuguese, and get a little bit more information about this.